Uh, first, thank you for the invitation here. Also, I'll preface the t that study that uh, Laurie quoted on over 14,000 men with no Gleason lymph node metastases. That was from our institution. So first, I'm going to talk about from a pathology standpoint as a pure morphologist, and then I'm going to as a clinical and clinician slash pathologist, meaning what does our diagnosis mean to the patient? So first, from the morphology standpoint, Gleason 6 is cancer. Cytologically, it's indistinguishable high power from Gleason pattern 4 from a pattern 3. Architecturally, it's infiltrative like, like cancers. There's perineural invasion. We see Gleason 6 cancers going outside of the prostate, and it merges in with higher grade cancer. From, I won't talk much about the molecular, but one of the hallmarks of an aggressive prostate cancer is loss of P10, and 10% of Gleason 6 prostate cancers have a loss of P10. Here we see a prostate cancer wrapping around nerve. Here we see prostate cancer extending out of the prostate. It's acting like a cancer, locally infiltrative, one of the definitions that uh, Lori mentioned is cancer. Here we see a cancer going up around the seminal vesicle, which is a Gleason 6 cancer. So it invades, like cancer, morphologically it is cancer. What would we call it if we didn't call it cancer? Maybe we'd call it some kind of a precancer lesion, maybe a tumor of low malignant potential, tumor of borderline malignancy. So let's assume we have this patient with a tumor of low malignant potential instead of a Gleason 6, which is what we call it today. It involves eight cores, 80%, 70%, 60%, 50 40 30 20 and a patient has a PSA of greater than 20 and he's a palpable nodule. That's a low malignant potential tumor. No, we know that that patient has a higher risk of having more aggressive cancer. We would all treat that patient aggressively. We wouldn't just say, oh, you don't have cancer. Now you could say, well, if we call it some pre-malignant lesion, we'll put an asterisk saying if the PSA is less than this, if the DRE is less than this, and it's a Gleason 6, then we call it a low malignant potential tumor. Anything else, we'll call it cancer. Obviously, things will change over time. That's too complicated. And again, there'll be a moving definition. So now let's get into the practical problems, talking from a clinician slash pathologist. Um, again, if you're going to call Gleason 6 uh, based on uh, everything, you would have to probably base it on the number of positive cords, the PSA, the extent of cancer in clinical stage, if you truly wanted to call something a low malignant potential tumor. And again, those criteria could change over time, further complicating the issue. The other issue is what do you do now with a case if you have somebody who has several cores with Gleason 6 and some with Gleason 7 or higher? you signing out this case as he has pre-malignant, uh, low malignant potential tumor in some areas and Gleason uh, real cancers in someone else. Even more problematically, what do you do with a Gleason 3 plus 4 or 4 plus 3 equals 7? The 3 is part of our cancer grade in that 3 plus 4 equals 7. If you call something a 3 plus 4 equals 7, what is that, a pre-malignant lesion plus a pattern four equals a Gleason seven? Um, again, just doesn't really make sense. One of the biggest issues, and Laurie touched upon it as well, is the potential of a sampling issue and also the variability in pathologist grading. So we know that when you diagnose a Gleason six on needle biopsy, there's a 20% chance that there's higher grade in the radical. Now, m much of what Laurie said I could agree with, if we could have a crystal ball when we did a needle biopsy, and in that crystal ball we said that entire radical prostatectomy is pure Gleason 6, no pattern 4, and we could say that if we followed that patient over time, we could have some magic imaging test or serum marker to say it's still pure Gleason 6 over time. If I knew somebody had a pure Gleason 6 over time, would I consider changing the name to some low malignant potential? Absolutely. But that's not the reality. The reality is that when we call something 6 on biopsy where we have to make our decisions, 20% of the time they have higher grade tumor in their prostate. And also there's the subjectivity that somebody might be calling something a 6 when I would look at it and say that's a 7 and we should be treating that patient. And that leads into even potential medical legal problems. I'm currently unaware of any lawsuit where one pathologist calls it a six and on review somebody calls it a seven. And I would defend such a pathologist saying there's some subjectivity. Um, it's just not something I think you could sue somebody on. But I could foresee a lawsuit where a pathologist calls something that now we call it a six and they call it a tumor of low malignant potential. And then down the road that patient gets into trouble and somebody goes back to review it and says, no, that wasn't a tumor of low malignant potential. That was a cancer. That was a Gleason 7. You didn't even call it cancer. Um, semantics, but important semantics. <laughs> 
But the most important reason why I think we have to still call these lesin 6 is for patient follow-up. I think if we start calling this some kind of a low malignant potential tumor, a lot of patients will not be followed closely. And they'll think, I don't have cancer. You know, I just don't have to come in every year to, to monitor my PSA or potentially get a repeat biopsy. And I think then some of these men will progress to non-curable cancer. In our active surveillance group, a third of our men who have Gleason 6, very restricted, low PSA, low volume, a third of these men eventually have higher grade cancer on repeat biopsy. Uh, but we follow them closely and they come back for treatment and follow up. Uh, you call somebody a low malignant potential tumor and say you're gonna get a repeat biopsy every year, uh, I think a lot of these patients won't do that. In terms of analogies to other organ systems, we call squamous cell carcinoma and basal cell carcinoma the skin, very indolent tumors, non-metastatic. Um, in terms of your own organ system, we call things non-invasive, low-grade papillary urethral cancer in the bladder. Patients don't get all freaked out about it and say, I need my bladder out. Um, they're very comfortable when you reassure them to say, we can follow you closely. This is non-life-threatening, but nonetheless, you know, we have to make sure it doesn't progress. So I think the answer is we still call them cancer, but the public has to be educated that Gleason 6 are, for the most part, not lethal cancers, and then basically, hopefully, they can deal with that in a more rational uh, manner. I think the key thing is a need for public education, educate patients, Gleason 6 cancers can be followed in large part with active surveillance, tell patients you have a good cancer, but we have to follow it um, because in some patients, um, we may have missed that more aggressive cancer or that the cancer can change over time, so we need to make sure that you continue to come closely uh, for follow-up. Can public perception of cancer change? Yes, it is. More and more patients are acting for active surveillance compared to several years ago, uh, based on just even a few lay press. And, but I think the key is really with the urologists. The urologists have to buy into the concept, and that may be, may be more of a problem in the United States than elsewhere in the world. But the urologists have to buy into the concept that Good, that these Gleason 6s are good cancers, and it, in the appropriate patient, they can educate them for active surveillance, uh, because it's urologists who are typically the first physicians who are going to be seeing these patients following the diagnosis. Another problem, though, is that currently the lowest grade that we have is Gleason 6. Um, and so for practical purposes, Gleason's pattern 1 and 2, uh, Gleason scores 2 through 4, we just don't diagnose them on biopsy. Uh, poor correlation with radical grade, poor reproducibility amongst experts. So the problem is, and again, I talk to one or two patients a day, you tell a patient they have a Gleason 6, they know the Gleason score goes from 2 to 10, they think they're in the middle, they don't think that they have a very good cancer, necessarily. So what we have proposed is, and what I add on every one of my biopsy reports, we give the grade, for example, Gleason 6 involving 20%, but then down below, and now again, many of our patients are getting our pathology reports, I will say that Gleason score less than or equal 6 is prognostic grade group 1, it's as good as you get, 3 plus 4 equals 7 is grade 2, still pretty good. 4 plus 3 is worse. 8 is getting to be bad. And 9 through 10 is even worse. So I think the answer is, I don't think we have to change what we call Gleason score 6 cancer. Rather, we need to change what the patients think when they hear that they have a Gleason score 6 cancer. It's up to the urologist to reassure and educate patients. And also, I think we have to start thinking about how to modify reporting of the Gleason scores to more accurately reflect their behavior. Thank you. Thank you for that. I think that was a very strong rebuttal there. So I, uh, I'll start with the with question. Um, you mentioned sampling as an issue. How do you think we will modify our risk stratification when we modify our sampling, targeted biopsies, that sort of thing? Do we, are we going to need to modify histological? Yeah, outputs? I think... The more accurately that we can, when we call something a Gleason 6, the more accurately we can be sure it's a Gleason 6, I think will be that much reassuring to patients. Now when I talk to patients, I say when you have a Gleason 6, you have an 80% chance of good cancer, but there's a 20% risk uh, that there's something worse. Um, if we can say there's a 90%, then we're going to be able to reassure them that much more. I just don't think we'll ever get up close to the 100%, regardless of our imaging um, techniques that we have or any kind of a serum marker. Great, thank you. Great. And uh, questions from the, from the floor? Sure. Um, microphone here, please. Professor I, I think, it, as you said, it has a <coughs> tremendous psychological <laughs> effect that you call is free plus free. If you just removed one and two from the scale and say he has one plus one, and the patients see that, I think that immediately would change 
his knowledge about his disease, and it would increase the chance that he will choose surveillance enormously. So why do you actually have one and two mm -hmm. still in your system? Why don't you remove them? Right. That's the first thing to do. Right. So right now, if I were to start with Gleason or grading, just grading <laughs> prostate cancer, and let's not call it the Gleason grading system. If I were to grade prostate cancer, I'd call it one through five. One would be a three plus three, just like I said in our prognostic grade group, two is still good, three plus four. And I would say you have a grade one tumor. That's great. You know, one is as low as you can get. Um, the, the major problem with that, and the reason why we report both, because if you do that, um, you have this whole literature out there, obviously hundreds of thousands of articles with Gleason score in it, and now you go all of a sudden to calling it one through five, uh, it introduces just tremendous problems in terms of comparison in the literature. Uh, but from the patient standpoint, I agree. I would call it one through five currently. And that's what I'm, we're trying to do in a sense. Okay, and Laurie, you got a comment to um, You know, I, I, what you say makes sense, and I think we're obviously more or less making the same argument that there's a nomenclature problem and that this behaves in a very uh, indolent fashion. Just one kind of related question, which is the Epstein criteria one and two cores only was based on sextant biopsies, and now we're doing either 10 or 14 cores or targeted biopsies. So where does that leave the Epstein criteria of uh, one to two cores and less than 50%? Should that be, should it be Epstein two, or are right. we gonna so stick we, with so that? Actually, so we have good, good question. <laughs> uh, we have now a paper that's um, being submitted on a larger group of patients, looking at all patients with 12 cores, uh, interestingly enough, it still ends up being one or two cords. That once you start getting three or four cords positive, even with other stringent criteria, those men have a significant higher risk of having more adverse disease. Um, what we have also found is, uh, is that, the, in a sense, our modified upside criteria is something is basically still Gleason 6, one or two cores, but also unilateral cancer. So the fact of having bilateral cancer makes it more likely of having a significant cancer. And, we put, and probably over time, we're going to drop our less than 50% of one core, which is more problematic, how people quantify it, uh, going to more unilateral versus bilateral, which is more objective. But we also thought that uh, you increase the number of cores, you're allowed to have more positive cores and still have a, an insignificant cancer. What we've done in this new paper also is grade the significance of cancer. Because to say cancer is insignificant or significant, um, there's a gradation. I mean, you can have a big Gleason 6, and that's worse than a small Gleason 6, uh, but it's not as bad as, obviously, some of the invasion. So we've tried to do that in our new paper. The, the UCSF group has proposed a digitized Gleason score where you get, like, Gleason 6.3. Uh, what, what, what uh, right. is that going anywhere? Right, so I think the only way that would go would be using morphometry. Uh, I think the human eye just cannot do that. There's enough human eye problems with just six versus, pattern three versus pattern four, and now tell them, is this a good three, kind of a 3.1 or a 3.4? But there are those cases, there's no question. I sign out a lot of cases, I say this kind of borderline pattern three versus four, t I tend to kind of usually give the patient benefit out and still call it a six, but it is a 3.4 sometimes. But I think the only way would be morphologically with a computer assessment uh, that eventually is shown to be prognostically significant. Thank you. And then just one quick question from Tim. Um, hi, Tim O'Brien. Um, <clears throat> the P10, you mentioned the P10. Do you report that? Does that correlate with a, a, a bad outcome in the six? Yeah, so the, at this point, we're not reporting P10. I think that's something that we, we are studying and others are studying. And the question is, P, loss of P10 is associated typically with more aggressive behavior. There is a minority, but significant minority, of Gleason 6s that have a loss of P10. What we don't know is really what that means long term to the patient. Um, high risk of upgrading in the, in the radical, uh, worse follow up on active surveillance. Those are things that I think have to be studied. <laughs> it's one thing to show a molecular finding, but ultimately you have to show how it clinically affects prognosis. He's got 20,000 patients with 20 years of follow up. How, how are we going to find out? You're, you must know the answer to that. <laughs> um, we're, we're in the process of looking. I mean, part of the problem with the active surveillance cohort, we have a, over 1,000 men on our active surveillance cohort. They get biopsies every year, so we have tissue in every, all these men. But the amount of tissue is extremely limited, um, to, you know, less than half a millimeter of cancer in many of these patients. And so um, many of the tests out there require so much more tissue to evaluate. It's not as simple a problem as when you really start looking at the logistics. Great. Thank you.